Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. When you uh, dismantle the cross in Gethsemane, when you dismantle the empty tomb and you get to thinking too highly of yourself, then you ought, you're in trouble. And I'm telling you, we're nothing apart from Jesus. We're nothing apart from the cross. We're nothing apart from the empty tomb and without hope. But oh, aren't you glad for Calvary and aren't you glad for the resurrection? Amen. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to take your Bible, look with me to the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Matthew chapter six, if you will. And uh, I want to take just a moment of personal privilege, if I could, and to thank all of you for your prayers, uh, for the cards, for the food for the major expressions of love that my family have uh, received from you. Those of you that attended the services, um, who sent condolences, I can't thank you enough uh, for loving on me and my family in the homegoing of my uh, 94-year-old mother this week. And uh, I tell you, it was uh, just a powerful moment. Heaven is a lot sweeter. I'm grateful that my mom is not suffering anymore and she's in the presence of Jesus. So thank you for everything that you have done and said to have uh, made this journey of ours uh, a lot easier for us. And uh, I will never forget you. Uh, I uh, make a little confession here. Um, I called a preacher to come and preach in my spot today. I thought, you know what? I'm exhausted uh, mentally and emotionally and spiritually, just worn out, and uh, I need somebody to come and preach, and he said yes, and as soon as he said yes, I knew that I'd made a mistake, and uh, I had no peace whatsoever, I had uh, nothing, and the overwhelming desire of my heart was to be here with you, and so I called him back, and I said to him, I said, I'm sorry. Uh, I made a mistake. God's not in me not being at First Baptist. Uh, I want to be around my family. And so today um, I'm here just thanking you and praising God uh, for you. And I have a word from him for us today. Second Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 5. The Bible says that the nation was uh, in major upheaval. They were in major trouble and they had numerous issues and problems that they were facing in their life. And I read 2 Chronicles 15 and I think about today and it's deja vu all over again uh, with us. We are facing in our country uh, major obstacles. We, we've got social problems. We've got cultural problems. We have political problems. We have relationship problems. We have economic problems. Our country is uh, overcome with lots of problems, but God doesn't leave us without a word. God doesn't leave us without hope, and God doesn't uh, ever uh, not have himself a man to speak hope and encouragement into the lives of his people. So he had an old boy by the name, a young man by the name of Azariah, Azariah spoke to the nation. I want you to listen to what he said. He said, listen, everybody. The Lord will be with you if you will stay with him. But if you abandon him, he'll abandon you. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God and without God's law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord and sought him and was found by him. We don't need to be looking at science for the solution to our problems. We don't need to be looking to Washington for the solution of our problems. Wall Street has nothing to say to us to heal our land. What we need to do is exactly what the nation of Israel did at the urging and the preaching of Azariah, but in their distress, 
they turn to the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to turn to the Lord and be found by him. That's what I want for me. That's what I've come today to encourage you. It's what I want for our church. It's what I want for our town. It's what I want to see happen in our county. It's what I want us to see happen in our state. It's what I want us to see happen uh, in our country, that in the midst of our distress, that we'll quit turning to false solutions and turn to the living God and be found by him. I felt led for a number of months. My staff will tell you that I've had a burden on my heart to preach uh, from the text of the Lord's Prayer. I, I think there are all kinds of reasons why that I have such a burden for this. One, it's the words of the Lord Jesus and that there is enough contained in the Lord's Prayer to meet every need that you and I will ever have in our life. And if there was anything else that was left uncovered, Jesus would have added it to the prayer so that it would be covered. Powerful words beginning in verse number nine. After this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I want to break this down and just tear it apart for the next seven weeks. And we'll take different segments of the prayer and make it applicable to the deepest needs that you and I have in our heart and our life. So I, I, I want you to be faithful. I want you to come every Sunday between now and the end of this time of study of the prayer that, the G, that Jesus taught us to pray. Today, I want to focus in on our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Um, until Jesus the world of ours uh, knew very little about the concept of God being a father. You're only going to find uh, that people referred to him as father in the Old Testament about seven times. So you're talking a span of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and only seven references to God being father. He was almighty. He was powerful. He was a force more than anything else. And uh, until Jesus came, that was kind of how he was uh, identified. But Jesus comes along and he refers to God as Father over 150 times in the New Testament. Why? Because God is not some kind of killjoy. He is not some impersonal power. God is a person. Now, understand something. Uh, the reason you're a person is because God created you and made you in his image. And because he is a person, he is capable then of having a relationship. And God created us in order that you and I might have a relationship with him. That's why that we don't sign off our prayers with may the force be with you. But in Jesus' name, and we do it personally because you and I have a relationship with God. Now, when we talk about God being our Father, that is good news to a lot of people. Except those people who grew up very much like uh, I did because it carries with them uh, some major negative connotations some major problems because when they hear the term that God is our father, all of a sudden the word father brings back bad memories. Uh, it opens up some old wounds that uh, may be carried around by people. And people will say, well, if God is like my father, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Or, or they would say, my father made my life hell for me. Uh, he was always moody and abrasive and domineering and 
controlling and angry and demanding and selfish and vicious and violent or he's just aloof. And so when people get to thinking about God being our father, all of a sudden, I'm not so sure I want to know him if he's like my earthly father. And it's got so much baggage. But here's the issue. People really don't have a problem sometimes with God at all because their problem is more related to the relationship that they had with their earthly father that they have transferred and transposed over into who they perceive God to be. Um, myself, along with many, many, many other people that have come to me down through the years that said, well, uh, my dad was unreasonable. And so they come to the conclusion if, if God is like my father here, then it's unreasonable, God, for you to think that I could live up to all of the expectations that are taught through your word. Maybe they grew up with a father that was unreliable and, and, and therefore when you get to talking about their walk with God, they have a very difficult time having a trust relationship uh, with God. Or they say, you know, that my uh, father was unconcerned. And so how in the world do you expect me to believe that God does care for me and that God loves me? Or maybe they come across and say, like my dad was, was kind of unpleasable. And so I'm going to spend all of my life uh, trying to live up to his standards and live up to his expectations. And I'm going to do everything that I can to please God in this fashion. And they transfer all of that over to their perception of God. You say, Mike, why are you talking about this kind of stuff? Well, I'm glad you asked. One out of every four kids in this country grow up without a dad in the home. 48% of all black kids grow up in a family without a daddy. 28% of all Hispanic kids grow up in a home where the daddy is absent. And 18% of all white kids grow up in a home where daddy is absent. And don't get real smug about that low number because it's tripled in the last 50 years. We got major problems uh, in America with fatherless homes. It's no wonder that we don't understand God. So he taught us to pray, our father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name. So we come to the conclusion that there is an expectation that we have a connection with God and we find it very difficult because there is no connection with our earthly fathers. Now this morning I want to deal very briefly uh, with some myths, uh, some misunderstandings and some miscommunications about who God the Father really is. I hope that you'll Hang in with me for a few minutes. First of all, I want you to know that God cares about you. He is a caring father. And here's the deal. God loves you really more than your mind can comprehend. Uh, you, you don't really have a clue how much God loves you because you cannot figure out the agape love, the unconditional love of God over your life any more than an ant crawling on the ground can figure out a human being. You and I don't have the brain capacity to figure out how much God really does love us. But God is a caring father. The Bible tells us in Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who honor God. Him. Uh, one, one of my favorite New Testament stories, and you know it is because I share it quite often uh, in relationship to a lot of issues that you and I deal with through the Word, is when the disciples and Jesus were out on uh, the Sea of Galilee, uh, nine miles wide and 27 mile long body of water surrounded by mountains and storms would come up on the water suddenly. And here they were out there on the lake, these professional fishermen. And Jesus, being tired, he goes to the back part of the boat and he lies down and he goes to sleep. And while he's asleep, this major storm came up on the water. 
Now, it must have been a Category 9 because these professional sailors and these professional fishermen couldn't handle it. The winds were so boisterous, the water was coming up over into the boat, they sensed that they were about to drown. Uh, before I finish the story, let, let me just say this to you. You ready? Uh, when Jesus is uh, on board uh, the boat of your life, you don't have to worry about going under. When he's on the ship of your life, you don't have to worry about going under. Uh, some of you are here this morning and your marriage is about to sink and you need to get Jesus on the board of your marriage. Uh, some of you are in the midst of your career and your career is about to go kaput. And what you really need to do is to get Jesus on the boat of your career. Some of you have relationships that are about to really dissipate. And what you really need to do is to get Jesus uh, on the boat of your relationship so that they don't sink. So they go back and to the back part of the boat where Jesus was asleep and they ask him an extremely important question. Lord, don't you care? You ever been there? You ever just wondered because of the storm that you were facing in your life? Lord, don't you really care about us? Maybe you just came from a doctor's visit and the doctor gave you some kind of diagnosis. He said, Lord, don't you care about the diagnosis? God, don't you care that my marriage is about to go under? God, don't you care that I'm about to lose my house because I don't have enough money to make the next house payment? God, don't you care? Can I just say to you, God cares about every area of your life. There is nothing about you that God doesn't care about. You say, does he care about my kids? Absolutely he cares about your kids. Does he care about the fact that I'm filled with fear? Absolutely. He cares about every aspect uh, of your life and always has. Now here's what God's word says in 1 Peter. 1 Peter says, cast all your cares... Cast all your anxieties on me because I care for you. Now, let, let me help you because some of you, you, you're carrying this tremendous burden. You're carrying this tremendous load. You're about to be overcome with some of the issues of this life and you're wondering what to do with it. And, and let's just look at that verse for a minute. He says to cast your anxieties. That, that's an interesting word. Unlike what we perceive it, to be. Oftentimes when we think about that word cast, we're thinking about throwing it aside. But the problem with that is some of you, it's so heavy, you couldn't throw it three feet if you had to. We, we think of it in terms as fishing. One of the last great activities I had with my grandson before he passed was we went to a little pond and fished for nearly all day long and I watched him as he'd catch fish after fish and he'd cast that line out into the water and reel it in. And so we have that idea of it being a fishing term and we cast it out. And, and then we have it maybe in a medical term. Somebody has broken their arm and they had to put their arm in a cast and we think of it in that fashion. But it's not that at all. The, the, the literal Greek definition of that word cast means to drop. It means to relax. It means to let it go. You don't have the energy to get rid of it and throw anything away. And God just says, just drop it. Just let it go. Just release it to me. Uh, and then, then he uses this next term. He uses this, uh, cast some of the things that you are carrying around on me. Is that what it said? What did it say? Cast what? Oh. Now, I, I, I've done a major study of that word. And you theologians, now, you, you hear my heart a minute. Now, what that, what, what that literally means in the Greek is all. <laughs> Cast everything. Cast it all on 
Jesus. You, you mean my house payment? Yes. You, you mean the grades that I have at school? Yes. Do you, you mean the pimples that break out on my face? Does God care about? Yes. C cast it all on God. Listen to this. Anything that's worth worrying about is worth casting on Jesus. Matthew 6 says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. The, the Father of heaven knows that you have need of those things. How many fathers are in the room? How many fathers are watching uh, by live stream or, or television? Would you hold your hands up for me a minute? Yeah, okay. Lots of dads. Oh, ton of dads on the internet. Thank God. We're good to see you guys. Fathers. Fathers, do you want your kids to worry about the fact that they're going to have anything to eat that night or not? Do you want your kids to worry about where they're going to sleep? Do you want your kids uh, to worry if they're going to have enough clothes to put on their back? Absolutely not. You don't want that to happen. And God says, if you being so imperfect know what your kids need and provide for them, how much more does your heavenly father know and care and doesn't want you to be anxious and worry about the needs of your life? He cares about you. He loves you. I, I, I said this earlier in, in the earlier service, and, and I believe it really to be true. Um, worry is a warning light that you really don't know how much God loves you. All right, let me give you number two. You ready? Say amen if you're ready. He's a consistent father. James 1, 17, the Bible says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. I want you to think just a minute before I go any further into the service. I want you to think about every good thing that you can think about that you have right now in your life. Every good thing that you have in your life. Just, just think about it for a minute. Well, the word says that all those good things that you have and that you can name, God gave it to you. He cares that much uh, about you. He's consistent. Um, some of you know a little bit about my upbringing, but my dad was uh, alcoholic is really too good of a word. When I was growing up, my dad was pretty much a drunk. And uh, he was an absentee father. He was not around very much. Uh, but uh, when he did come home, I never knew uh, what kind of condition that my dad would be coming home in. I didn't know if he'd be drunk. I didn't know if he'd be sober. I didn't know if he'd be angry. I didn't know if he'd be in a good mood or a bad mood. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if he'd be accepting of me or rejecting of me or being aloof of me. I did not know. I, I did have a little... Uh, I did have a little signal and a sign that I always looked for when he walked in the door, whether he would be drunk or sober. When my dad even smelled alcohol, his lips would, uh, right there in the center, would be swollen. Just that one little spot right there. And if that little spot right there was raised up, I knew that it was time for me to go in a different direction. Uh, it would not be good. Uh, and, and so I lived... With anticipation, every time that he walked in the door um, of what am I going to get today? Uh, what, what dad is going to walk in my... And I couldn't depend on him. Would he be a good mood or would he be in a bad mood? Can I just say that God's never moody? Uh, God never gets up on the wrong side of the bed. He, he doesn't have a good mood or a bad mood he doesn't have a good day or a bad day. I can always count on God treating me the same way all of the time. Now, I want you to look at this passage of Scripture with me in 2 Timothy 2.13. Watch this. And I want you to 
to read it out loud. It says, even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. Say that out loud with me. Even if we are faithless, he, God, remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. He cannot be anything but himself. And he's going to remain faithful to us. He's going to be consistent every day with us. Would you agree with me that the world is changing more rapidly? I'm 48, 49 years old right now. And you know, the, the world has never changed more rapidly in my life. I mean, things are flying off the shelf. Things are flying uh, off the walls quicker than we can ever imagine. And with everything that is so up in the air in our culture, in our land today, we need a spiritual anchor that we can hold on to. And the only thing, that, listen, everything you name is going to change in this life. And the only thing that's not going to change is the loving, caring, compassionate, consistent love of our Heavenly Father that we can count on. Now, let me give you number three. He's a close father. In Acts chapter 17, the Bible says God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. Now, there are a bunch of you that are here today, and you came in here and you're thinking, you know, God, uh, I, I, you just seem so distant. Uh, I haven't sensed your presence and your nearness. And, and God, you just seem so far away. Let, let me just help you with, under, with something. You can't go by your feelings. Feelings will deceive you. Feelings will disappoint you. Uh, the, the word is very clear that he is with you right now. Not a million miles away that you may feel. He is right as close as calling on his name. My dad was never around. Um, I played, uh, played on a state championship basketball team. Three years of varsity basketball. I, I uh, was the president of my senior class. Uh, not, not one person in my family ever saw any game of three years that I played in. Not, not one person was ever at uh, my high school graduation. I was the first one off the stage with my diploma. And I looked out over that hundreds of people that had come that day and not one person in my family. You talk about feeling alone and that nobody cared. Uh, it was uh, amazing. And I just felt like as I was growing up that I had to do something to earn their attention that I had to do something to earn their approval. And so I thought, well, you know, if I just excel at this and I excel at that, uh, then maybe they will notice me. And that transferred over into my spiritual life as well. And I thought, you know what? Uh, God, uh, here I am. And so I started going to church. I started singing. I, I started doing all of this stuff. And they told me at that time that I had to walk like this. I had to talk like this. I, I had to perform. And that God then would accept me. Now, that'll mess you up. S some of you are here today. I, I, I promise you. There, there are a lot of people that are here today and you're sitting in your seat and, and you have this concept, hey God, it's the first Sunday of 2021 and God, I'm here. Do you see me? Hey God, right over here. I'm, I'm right here. And you go to church for the approval of God. And, and, and through the week, you, you may even get somewhere and you get your Bible out and, and you're reading, hey, hey God, I just... <laughs> I want you to know, God, I, I, here I am. I, I'm, I'm studying your word now. God, don't, don't you love the fact that, that I'm studying your word? And maybe you even pray and, and, and you're on your, hey, God, I'm, I'm just, you know, I got this daily thing going on with you and, and I just want you to know now, God, I've got seven days in a row I haven't missed. And, and you think that if I just work, if I just spend if I just perform, 
that maybe God you will love me more may I say to you you can't earn God's love you can't work for God's love you can't perform for God's love why is that because the love of God is a free, unwarranted, unmerited gift from God to your life. I want to free you up. I got a word that will free you up from that kind of performance trap that many people find themselves on. You ready? Shake your head like that. I'm ready. I want that word. You ready? Quit it. Just stop it. You, you can't measure up to that. His love is a gift. Here's some things that I found out about the love of God. You ready for this? Number one, I found out that he's never too busy for me. Isn't that a wonderful thought? God's never too busy for me. The Bible says the Lord is near all of them who call on him. All of us. He's never too busy for you. The second thing I want to give you today is that God loves to meet your needs. We get into this mindset that, you know, you're praying and you're asking God for this and you're asking God for that and you're seeking him for this and seeking for... God, I really hate to bother you again about this, but God, you know, God, I hate to, to, to trouble you and I hate to ask again, but baloney. It thrills God to meet the needs of your life. Let me give you the third thing. Boy, this has been rich in 2020. He sympathizes with my hurts. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. All right, let me give you that next one. He's a capable father. I love this part. I love to be able to tell churches that there's nothing too hard for God. Jeremiah 33. Is there anything too hard for God? The answer comes roaring back. No. There's nothing, not even to the changing of your life. Nothing too difficult for him. I, I read a book a number of years ago called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. It's all small stuff. Well, that's true with God. There's nothing too big for God. There's nothing too difficult for God. There's nothing overpowering to God. The Bible says that he can do all things, everything. Even what he says is beyond your imagination. He can meet every need of our life. He's a big God. One of the things, I, I, you want to hear a pet peeve of your preacher? I hate what Hollywood has done to fatherhoods. I do. I hate what Hollywood has done to the image of fathers in our country. <clears throat> Hollywood has uh, made fathers look like a bunch of buffoons. All you got to do is just pay attention. It's glaringly obvious. I heard about a little boy. He looked at his friend. He said, my daddy can beat your daddy up. Friend looks back and says, well, that's nothing. Mama can do that. <laughs> you know? That's just kind of the attitude and the disposition that we have been given. But I can tell you this. Nobody can beat your heavenly father up. Nothing impossible with God. He's able to do exceedingly above all that you could ever ask or think or imagine. Well, while I'm on a roll, let me just go on one more roll with you. Hallowed be thy name. Reverence his name. I'm sick and tired of my ears and my heart and my mind being bombarded in conversations with people who throw out the little term, oh my God, OMG. And we throw it so flippantly, just become 
ordinary part of our language. In the name of Jesus, quit it. Mark it down that in 2021, you're not going to let that pass through your lips. I'm not mad. I'm just passionate. Hallowed reverence. The, the name of God. And shame on you for using that term. In fact, shame on you for just throwing God's name out there and in the name of Jesus, just ask him to forgive you and help be helped by him to stop that horrible habit. Now, let me close by saying this. Um, God's not everybody's father. Uh, God's everybody's creator but God's not everybody's father. Buried my mom the other day, 94 years old. When she was 75 years old, she called me up and she said, Mike, something's happened to me. I said, what in the world, mama? She said, I, I was just here in the den by myself. Your dad's gone somewhere and, and I'll just here in the den by myself and, and, and she said, there's something happened to me. I said, well, talk to me about it, Mom. Tell me, tell me what, what it is. And she said, I just felt like that if I died, I'd go to hell. That I couldn't remember ever a time in my life where God ever saved my soul. And she said, I asked God to forgive me. And I asked him to save me. And he, she said, Mike, I, I've never had anything like this to happen before in my life. Seventy-five years old. Nineteen years ago. On a hot summer day. My mama became a child of God the Father. I went up there and uh, you, you talk about an awesome experience to baptize my mama in obedience to her faith in Jesus. It was an amazing day. Went back, uh, I don't know, a short time later and ordained my daddy as a deacon at 80 years old. Why? Because he became a son of God. What a beautiful thought. I don't have any memories of my mom and my daddy. when I was growing up, sharing in my life. Had a guy came up to me after the last service. And he was just weeping because he said, you know, my dad never missed a game that I ever played in. And I rejoiced with him. I rejoiced with him. I did. But I look back at the first 20 years of my life, how many moments my mom and dad missed in my life. That sweet lady sitting right over there with that new top that I bought her for Christmas right over here on the right hand side. First person ever to say I love you was her. I never heard them. Never heard that word fall on my ears until she said them. Here's something so staggering. God has never missed a moment in my life. God's never missed a moment in your life. Before the foundation of the world, he knew you. He formed you in the womb of your mama. 
He heard you first cry. He knows everything about you. He even knows what color your hair was before you put that stuff on it. <laughs> He's never missed a moment. He loves you that much. You say, how do I, uh, how do I become one of his children? Same way everybody does. Through faith in his son, Jesus. You got to come to grips somewhere along the way that you're a sinner and your sin has separated you from God. And you've got to repent of that sin. And that repentance means that you acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you turn away from that sin and by faith you turn to Jesus and become a son or a daughter of God. And whether you're watching live stream or by television or whether you're here, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's that close. He's that near. Would you bow with me in prayer? I wonder if there'd be some of you that right where you're seated or live streaming with us, would you right where you are, would you just cry out to God, God, please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart and into my life. I trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Savior. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Father, I pray for our media audience, I pray for the physical audience. I pray that nobody would be ashamed of what they just prayed. Would you please get glory right now in this invitation? Have your will in your way in everybody's heart and life. I ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.